Let me bring to the show our next guest this morning, Jason Schenker, Prestige Economics. Good morning, Jason. Thank you so much for joining us today. Good morning, Alex. Great to be here. Jason, we're witnessing an extreme volatility on Wall Street. So what's driving the price action in these past 24 hours? Yeah, there are a couple of things, right? There's concerns about the Fed and there's concerns about what could happen in Europe with the Ukraine and Russia. And so that's really the top priorities that folks are concerned about, what's going to happen with the cost of capital and what's going to happen with overall geopolitical stability. Uh, on the other side, um, in terms of market direction, what are your expectations? Are we going to see even deeper uh, selling or, or maybe a little bit of bounce back? Well, we've seen some real choppiness here at the beginning of the year. There are some really mixed dynamics in terms of where people are putting the money, where we're seeing capital flows and what segments in equity markets are performing well. What we know is that bond markets have been selling off significantly. You look at bond yields, they, they've been rising significantly in recent months and whether that's the one year treasury or the 10 year or we're looking at high yield bond indices, those are all moving up because of the expectation that that higher cost of capital from the Fed could result in significantly higher costs of capital for those uh, riskier credits as high yield credits as well as distressed debt. So you've got those things going on in the bond market. Those increased costs of capital are going to impact the equities of those companies that are tied to those credits, right? If you have a, a lower credit rating, uh, then you're going to be paying more for debt in the future. And of course, if you are cash flush and you have a, a solid credit rating and you have good cash flow, then right now the, there's more attraction from investors for that kind of stock. So we're going to see those things all play out. Really, it's the bond market where we see still the greatest downside risk as rates go up that those yields could rise across bond markets and we could see prices fall. And for equities, I think we're going to continue to see some bifurcated dynamics, a flight to quality, a flight to value over growth. I think we're going to see those things continue to play out through the year. And I think we are going to see some choppy equity markets. Of course, different things. The Fed moves faster than people think that that could hit equity markets. If the situation in Ukraine with Russia devolves further, uh, that could hit especially European equities. In fact, it is. Um, let me just uh, let me just ask in, on the other side, of course, inflation is once again front and center, um, as always, of course. So I was wondering, what are your expectations? A lot of Fed speakers today, Bullard specifically, uh, extremely aggressive in terms of rates monetary policy, rates policy to be uh, more concrete. So I was wondering, do you expect an aggressive tone when it comes to rate hikes or do you expect more, how can I say, um, you know, calmer situation, which, which means in numbers, translated to numbers, 25 basis points increase along with quantitative tightening? Well, there's a couple of things, right? The Fed doesn't want to surprise markets because big surprises can often trigger very rapid sell off. So what is typical is when you have Fed speak, uh, different members on the Fed speaking, they might often float ideas and share things in advance of the Fed meeting so that you can gauge market response. So this is something that's a really important element to understand, right? Fed doesn't want to just shock anyone. But one of the things that people have been expecting, especially after that most recent CPI report, up 7.5% year on year for inflation. That's a very big number, uh, the highest number, I believe, since February of 1982. I mean, that's a lot of inflation. That's been a while, right? And so Fed members now, the thought is they might be floating these more aggressive moves to test in the market if we're going to see a 50 basis point rate hike in March, so on March 16th, and the markets really are looking for now, I think, a 50 basis point rate hike at that first meeting, no longer 25 bips. Now, 50 basis points, I, I, that's still going to be a very low rate. We're moving from zero to 0 0.25, right up to 0 0.5 to 0 0.75. So it's still relatively low interest rate, but that move up in rates can weigh on, housing markets can weigh on the bond market very significantly uh, and it can weigh on a number of equities. So we're looking at a lot of volatility around those moves and the Fed likely front loading the rate hikes 
because they don't necessarily want to wait for the genie to get any further out of the bottle and cause systemic problems inflation-wise across the economy that become persistent and uh, really unable to address. So, so do you think um, there is for, for some time this buzzword, which is stagflation, do you, do you think they are concrete risks for stagflation uh, in the U.S.? So here's the thing about stagflation, right? It means stagnation and inflation. And we've seen it in the past where there were supply shocks, right? Think about the, the oil crises in the past, in the 70s, right? That, that really is what caused some of that stagflation. This time, what's going on is we have lots of growth and lots of inflation. It's more like growthflation rather than stagflation. Last year, we saw the, the highest inflation rates, right, since the 80s. We saw also the highest GDP growth rate last year since 1984. So we've seen very strong growth. The labor market is very strong. Initial jobless claims in the fall of 2021 were at the lowest level since 1969. At that time, that's a 52 year gap, right? So the labor market is very strong. We, we see that in all the reports. We know that from the Help Wanted Online numbers, there's a huge shortage of people in the labor force. Labor market's tight. GDP growth is strong. And what do you know? When you get a really strong economy with really strong growth, a really tight labor, labor market, you also get really high inflation. And that's what's going on. It's, it's growthflation, not stagflation. <laughs> All right, this is very nice. So, which means, I, I guess that the problem is not, of course, inflation. The problem is that the, the Fed is not hiking rates. Is this what you're saying? Well, I think the problem is that the economy, everyone wants the economy firing on all cylinders. And right now the economy is firing on eight cylinders. The problem is we have a six cylinder economy, right? So the Fed, as they raise rates, and by the way, as we sit here right now, the Fed is engaging in additional quantitative easing and is still buying right. additional new mortgages and treasuries. So right. we're talking about all these rate hikes. Even right now, they're still being wildly accommodative. So, you know, it, it, at the end of the day, as the Fed raises rates, what they would like to see, I think, is the economy cool and we take some of the froth out of the top of the inflation piece and we see some slowing in business activity and some slowing in GDP growth and some slowing in additional labor market gains, but they don't want any of those things to collapse. And they certainly don't want to have a hard landing with this, which means right, they're not gonna, the economy in many respects is very similar right now to where it was before COVID, but they're not gonna raise interest rates at the first meeting to be exactly the way it was before COVID. Economically, that would seem justified, but from a market standpoint, that would be crazy. So what we're seeing is the Fed is going to try to move more quickly than they normally do to get us back to pre-COVID interest rates because the labor market and the economy are at or stronger than they were before COVID. Uh, Jason, final take. Are you concerned about energy prices um, since here in Europe, of course, this is major contributor to inflationary pressure, so the upside, of course. Uh, in the US, not, not so much, but still they are totally present. So I was wondering, are you concerned because if we are going to see higher crude oil prices, higher natural gas prices, higher commodities prices, inflation is most likely here to stay? Yeah, so two pieces here. One is the European uh, sure. energy mix is more exposed, That's right? For On the sure. one hand, we've got you know the the upside for nat gas and power because of the reliance on Russian gas. In the U.S. Uh, that's not as big an issue, but there's still an upside to global oil prices if Russian crude oil were to be disrupted. And the U.S. summer driving season is the biggest seasonal driver of oil demand in the world. And this summer driving season in the U.S. is going to be a monster. And that's going to really drive up demand. Now, as for does that make inflation permanent? Two things. One, inflation rates, right, prices of oil could remain high or go higher. But inflation isn't about what the level of oil prices is or natural gas or power. It's about how quickly they're going up. 
So if oil prices remain high but go up more slowly than they've been going, that would represent a slowing in inflation, right? Inflation's still up, price not going down. This is kind of what the Fed's looking for. The Fed's not looking for the prices of everything to go back down to where they were before COVID. That would be deflation. Year on year price declines are, are not something the Fed's looking for either. There's economic risks with that. What they're looking for is the rate of price increases across the whole economy to hopefully slow. And I think with oil prices where they've been recently in these $90 uh, to $100 kind of range here, you know, that for oil prices is a high range. Are we going to get the same year on year percent change 12 months from now that we got over the last 12 months? That seems unlikely. And, and that would mean that the inflationary pressures, the number that gets published as year on year inflation would actually ease even if the prices still remain high. It's just they're not going up as much as they did in the last 12 months. Right. Thank you very much, Jason Schenker. Thank you, Alex. Great to catch up with you. Prestige Economics. Have a great weekend, Jason, and talk to you very soon, hopefully. Thank you. Have a good one.